Welcome everyone. Today we have with us someone very special all the way from Australia. He has been studying traditional forms of posture, movement, breathing and mental control for more than 50 years. He has studied with one of the greatest yogic masters of the 20th century, BK Sanger, K Patta by Joyce and TKV Desi Kachar. Also he has co-authored two books out of which the applied anatomy and physiology of yoga course is surely recommended and today he helps everyone restore their natural posture fusing traditional eastern wisdom with western medical science welcome simon It's a very big pleasure to be invited by you today. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be with your wonderful uh, broadcast here. Thank you for gracing us. Moving on to what is your speciality and that is very much connected to breathing and postures. Why do you think breathing is so important while performing an asana? Okay, breathing is definitely very important in performing an asana and many people will say things like breath is the link between body and mind or breath is the link between conscious and unconscious and so often people will say you're not really doing yoga unless you're connected with your breath but the way i see it is that it's not breathing as such that is the link between body and mind or between conscious and unconscious the link is actually specifically your diaphragm and more specifically, it's the phrenic nerve which connects to the diaphragm because the diaphragm is one important muscle in the body, which has a very special feature that it's able to be used by the conscious mind and also by the unconscious mind. The diaphragm is a muscle where you can go, I want to breathe into my abdomen. And so you make your diaphragm contract and descend and it feels like pressure comes into the abdomen. Of course, the air is going to your chest, but it feels like you're breathing into the abdomen. And we do this consciously whenever we want to, most people can. And when we're asleep, that happens by itself. We're not even thinking about it. The autonomic or automatic system does it for us. So the, the, the lungs, the um, diaphragm is a very special uh, muscle in that case because it has dual control, both conscious and unconscious. And of course, the chest muscles don't have that. If you are breathing in the chest unconsciously, it's, it's probably meaning you're under a very great strain of stress and it's not, you probably won't be able to sleep. But unconscious breath is diaphragmatic breath. But the wonderful thing about the diaphragm is you can control it consciously and unconsciously, which makes it a special bridge between conscious and unconscious and allows you to do essentially the possibility of accessing the unconscious mind. So what's special about the breath then and why it's important in yoga is it's because diaphragmatic or natural breathing is actually a link between conscious and unconscious. There's much more to the breath, but I think that's the place that people often forget. And often people mess up their breath by inhibiting their diaphragm, locking their core and breathing into the chest. And then they often not just inhibit the diaphragm, they over tense and over breathe, which causes a stimulation of the flight or fight response. And the flight or fight response will turn off all the organs that keep you healthy because they're the organs. The organs that keep you healthy really for longevity are your immune system, digestive system, reproductive system. And in the state of flight, fight, freeze or fear, which is the sympathetic nervous system dominant state, then you turn off all the things we need for longevity because you're trying to fight some external foe now. And of course, the sympathetic nervous system, when it's fully charged, has its dominant subconscious emotions to be fear, anger, aggression, lack of safety, lack of trust, which sounds like the opposite of yoga. So what I feel we need for yoga is to minimize the effects of the sympathetic nervous system and turn on the parasympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system has the euphemism that it's the rest rejuvenation relaxation and regeneration mode it's the mode we want to be in most of the time and it's going to help us encourage the function of our immune system digestive system reproductive system and has as its dominant subconscious emotions emotions such as love and peace and safety and trust and all the things that we want for yoga so is it that uh, many people by mistakenly uh, think that they have to breathe during an asana but they uh, unconsciously get into the flight or fight mode which 
affects them. Mm. Yes, I think we have this euphemism, which or this this concept in the modern world, which says you should breathe more, you should get your heart rate up more, you need to stretch more and tense your muscles more. Whereas actually, really, a very healthy person would be someone like an elite athlete who runs very quickly, but they hardly breathe at all. Their heart hardly races at all. They might do gymnastics, but it doesn't feel like they're tensing or stretching their muscles at all. But someone who's very sick and not so healthy might walk very slowly and they might be breathing. And their heart will be panting just from walking. And they'll move their leg and they'll go, oh, the front of my leg feels like it's stretching. Oh, it feels like so much work. They're the ones who are feeling stretch, tension, heart rate, breathing, excessive. They're the sick people. Healthy people have their heart beating less while moving blood very easily. Healthy people have lots of energy without having to breathe so much. And also healthy people can move very good range of motion without feeling tense or stretchy. And so often we have the wrong impression. We don't want to breathe more. We want to firstly learn how to reestablish natural breathing and ideally be able to exercise while breathing with the same minimal effort that you might have while you're asleep, ideally. Mm, means uh, okay the first point itself has given me uh, connected to a lot of questions which I've already prepared but yes uh, I'll come back to the Bandas part uh, you did mention in your bio that uh, you had learned Uddiyana Band much before you started yes. your yoga journey so yes. what is the importance of all the Bands okay well the word Banda is a Sanskrit word used in yoga, which uh, means to bind or to lock. And it's a, a subset of mudra. And I like to think of mudra as meaning some sort of energy control. And I think the purpose of yoga, I mean, many people will have different purposes, but the way I understand it best is to say that yoga, which we know means some sort of union, is not to try and unify anything, but it's rather to recognize that our individual consciousness is one with the universal consciousness. So Atman, Paratman, uh, uh, linked already. And we don't have to do anything to do that. We've just got to realize it and maybe act like it. But I don't think that this is something which is easy to do I, I don't think it's possible for everyone to treat each other with the loving nature of yama and niyama unless they can first treat themselves up that way. So I believe our personal role and the personal purpose of hatha yoga will be to use the tools of posture, movement, breathing, mental control, perhaps a bit of dietary control as well, to encourage the movement of good energy and loving information within ourselves. So what we want then on our physical practice is to move good energy and loving information, healthy blood flow and a dominant parasympathetic calming state through the body while the body is kept in a safe and strong way. And what regulates the movement of energy and loving information inside your body is this thing we call mudra. And mudra, we could call energy control. When we talk about energy control, the simplest way for people to understand it, I think, is blood control. How does your blood circulate through the body? And in the lay person's mind, most people think that blood circulates because your heart beats. But actually, the heart is the worst way you can move blood through your body. And almost everyone in India knows the adage that says that the yogi counts their life not by the number of years they live, but by the number of heartbeats their heart makes and the number of breaths they take. Everyone in India knows that and in China and other traditional cultures. But in the West, we have this erroneous idea that it's good to get your heart rate up, but actually it probably just causes stress. So to get blood flow happening, we can use, and to get blood flow regulated throughout the body, we have this system we can call mudra. And mudra we could call the regulation of blood flow and other energetic flows throughout the body. And so well, I've written papers, which uh, would be nice to share with you know, some of your uh, people and clients, etc., and uh, some of your followers, on the 12 different ways you can move blood through the body. And these are really the secret ways of mudra. And you know, some of them include certain postures, certain gestures, 
and others include the one of the subsets of mudra is essentially bandha and so bandha is on an anatomical level the co-activation of antagonistic muscles around a joint complex and i'll say that in english co-activation means to simultaneously tense the opposite muscles around the major joints in the body and there's there's nine major joint complexes in the body we have ankles knees hips the waist the chest the neck and the head the shoulders elbows and wrists and around these nine joint complexes you can create activation of muscle in such a way that you either prevent blood flow through that point like a lock like a closed door or you actually create a muscular activation that actually opens that lock you see many people don't realize that the word lock is also a lock whether the lock is locked or unlock so you can have a door if the door is open it's still called a door and so bandha has two opposing states which i refer to as ha bandha which is a closed lock that prevents blood flow and a ta bandha which is an opened lock these bandhas exist all throughout the body and in most uh, yoga textbooks like for example in ayenga's book he says there are three main bandhas udiyana bandha mula bandha and jalandhara bandha and udiyana relates to the chest joint complex mula bandha relates to the lower waist or the waist and jalandhara relates to your neck and head so he says there are three main bandhas well that suggests there's more and so if you look in the texts on siddha yoga they talk about kati bandha mani bandha janu bandha kulpa bandha this is kulpara bandha on the elbow and so these are the things i've written about in my book on the applied anatomy and physiology of yoga but in that case the two most important purposes of bandha is number one bandha acts as a mudra because a bandha is like a lock which either can be locked open or locked closed and if the lock is closed blood won't flow but as soon as you open it it will flow and but bandha also has the possibility of creating stabilization around the joints mm -hmm. and in the modern world most people think that's the only purpose of bandha so many people talk about creating mula bandha or udiyana bandha around the waist in order to stabilize their lower back but the problem is most people are using the wrong version of the bandha so for example many people try and look very strong and try and do strength actions by narrowing their waist and expanding their chest which gives you a compressive mula bandha and an expansive uddiyana bandha now they're not wrong bandhas but they're very good for pranayama but they're not good if you want to lift up to a handstand or if you want to pull weeds if you want to do a strength activity you need the compressive uddiyana bandha where the chest is compressed and the expansive mula bandha which looks a little bit like nauli where the abdomen and the rectus abdominis are firm pushing out and anyone who does ashtanga yoga and works with it uh, ashtanga vinyasa yoga knows this intuitively but often with the ashtanga yoga practitioners they work with the idea of 99% practice 1% theory and they're not understanding the anatomy behind it so many people teach that you should draw your navel toward the spine but people do it with the wrong muscles many people teach even erroneous things like mula bandha is tight anus and to a certain extent patabi joyce with his poor english actually said that sometimes he was a beautiful man but his english wasn't that good so he would teach his students tighten your anus and call it mula bandha whereas actually anal tightening is ashrini mudra and mula bandha is really to do with the perineum not the anus so this oh. was a an error in transmission of language you know so there's a lot of stuff about bandha which is very interesting and when applied properly it can give you very many benefits physically physiologically and also mentally as well yes um uh, to speak out specifically about jalandhara band so whenever i have practiced that i have noticed that uh, the saliva under the neck it basically frees up after practicing that and i'm not sure i have asked other people and they have some have similar reactions some have different reactions but let's say if you have a Um, a party or something a day before, and you might have some sore throat kind of a condition. And let's say if you do perform Jalandhara Band, then you feel better with, it. as in like there's some energy which flows up. 
it like opens up so that's what i have felt i am not sure uh, how many others have felt that but yeah it makes sense it makes sense because what you're doing is you're often like if you have say a um I mean, it sounds like a funny example, but sometimes when a toilet, for example, is blocked, then what you do is you get a plunger and you push it in and push it out, push it in and push it out, and this unblocks it. So when we bring the head down, neck back, that compresses that region. And then if you lift your throat forward, chin up, that releases that region. So right. the act of creating and releasing Jalandhara Bandha could actually use internal pressure changes to actually release blockages, which you might get if you say you have a sickness and you've got some sort of phlegm or something like that. It would make sense that you can relieve things like that. It's certainly, if done properly, Jalandhara Bandha can be very good to relieve people's neck problems. Mm, that's true. Uh, I've also heard uh, that it's very much good for having a smooth thyroid uh, function. Yes, of course, yes, yes. because the thyroid yes. will be appropriately massaged with the pressure on, of the Jalandhara Bandha. And of course, as I mentioned before, when you bring the head down, neck back, and then throw it forward, chin up, which you would, would, be, you would be doing that in something like Surya Namaskar. And so that's going to actually increase and decrease the pressure around the thyroid, which effectively will push blood in and out of the thyroid because the thyroid hasn't got muscles of its own. So you need to pump the thyroid in this way using these, this simple bundle control. Mm. So speaking about uh, prana, in pranayama, what are the actual changes that occurs in the body and brain? Okay. Well, some important changes that come with good pranayama will be to improve blood flow to the brain and also to increase the uh, calmness in the nervous system. And this happens predominantly if pranayama done properly is a reduction in minute ventilation. So when we talk about how much you breathe, the easiest way of understanding it is using the expression which is called minute ventilation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but just for the audience. Minute ventilation is the amount of air that one would take every minute if you measured the number of breaths you took and the volume of air in each breath. So the average person at rest will breathe between 10 and 20 breaths every minute and say for example, it's 10 breaths a minute, then in that 10 breaths, maybe they might breathe half a liter of air. So half a liter is like half a bottle of air like this. And so 10 half bottles will be about five liters, you know, so 500 mils a breath times 10 breaths a minute means the average person breathes about five liters of air every minute. And you can read this in any physiology textbook that is quite normal and natural for a person at rest to breathe about five liters of air per minute. It does also say that sick people will breathe much more. And it also says that the average lung capacity for the average adult is about five liters. So in other words, we breathe the equivalent of about one full breath every minute. And the biggest mistake people make with pranayama is they try and make it too accessible for normal people. And they try and tell people, take a slow, deep, full breath in, and a slow, long, deep, full breath out. And if you do it at that speed, then people will take a full inhalation of a full lungs in three seconds, and then exhale in three seconds, which means they're taking a full lung full of air every six seconds. And if they did that for, 10 breaths, it would be one minute, they would be breathing 10 times as much air as what their body says they should breathe. And that's a little bit like putting too much fuel or air into the carburetor of a car and you'll choke the car. So what we want, if you want to get true pranayama, pranayama won't even begin to have a positive effect on the physiology of the body, mostly until you can learn to breathe less than one full breath a minute. And in fact, in some of the texts that I've written, including one which I'll draw your listeners to, which is called A Treatise on the Philosophy of Yoga by N.C. Paul. And that's P-A-U-L. And it's published in India in 
1855. So it's available for free on Google if you look it up. Wow, okay. And text. It's, it's a wonderful book. In that text, he says that pranayama is, he says, begins when you can do 12 seconds inhale, I think it's 624 seconds breath retention kumbhaka, and then 24 seconds exhale. So he's basically saying that you have to breathe in for 12, hold the breath for more than five minutes, and then exhale for 24 seconds. He says that's when pranayama starts. Wow. So if I'm telling you that pranayama won't start, at least if you can breathe less than one breath a minute, I'm being generous. He's being much more harsh. In fact, he says that the next stage of uh, yoga after pranayama is pratyahara, which most people think is withdrawal of the senses. N.C. Paul, in this book from India in 1855, says that no, pratyahara is when you inhale 12 seconds, hold the breath for 10 minutes, and exhale for 24 seconds. Wow. Then he says <laughs> that there is dharana, and most people think dharana is concentration. He says no, dharana is inhale 12 seconds, hold the breath for 20 minutes, exhale 24 seconds. And then, of course, dhyana, which most people think is visualization or meditation or something. He says, no, dhyana is inhale 12, hold the breath for 40 minutes, exhale 24 seconds. And of course, samadhi, he says, is inhale 12, hold the breath for 80 minutes, exhale 24 seconds. But of course, samadhi has, what, eight stages? So then you understand why in India, they talk about people burying themselves under the ground or not breathing for weeks. But of course, if you say that to anyone in the West, then they say, oh, that's nonsense. People can't breathe for, you know, can't hold their breath for more than five minutes. But almost every one of my beautiful friends and everyone I've met in India, if I say, is it possible for a human to be buried under the ground for weeks and not breathe? Every person in India will say yes. Mm. Pretty much. That's, that's true. That's true. Ideas. Yes. The you, West you, is very doubtful of these things. You will find a lot of mistakes around in India, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. No, um, I, I, I mean, I believe it's true. I believe it's possible to breathe very, very small amounts. And I think the easiest way of doing it is to breathe naturally and proceed with the acts of things like meditation. I think that although pranayama is very powerful, and I do enjoy do pranayama, I think it's something which for most people is addressed too early. And so what they do when they address it too early is they will over breathe and become over tense. And I think a better approach for most normal adults, especially when they're starting as adults, and they have many dysfunctions, many stresses, is to reestablish natural breathing. And natural breathing has got five main features. Number one is the inhalation is very low. In other words, they feel the in-breath around their lower abdomen, their lower back, and their pelvic floor. And the second thing is the exhalation in natural breathing is passive. There's no extra muscles used when you exhale passively. The third thing is that natural breathing is invisible, inaudible, very minimal breath. You don't hear sound. You don't feel tension. It's, you can't, not even, sometimes you can't see it even. And then natural breathing also is usually through the nose, which is the best way to sleep. And then also natural breathing has got this special feature that you can forget about it. So I believe that training yoga in the beginning, what we want to do is not get people to breathe more, but just to reestablish natural breathing and make sure that every once in a while they check their breathing naturally that they haven't locked their diaphragm, they're not breathing too much into the chest. And once they've mastered doing natural breathing in a set of fairly complex postures and movements, and they can sustain these, then they become ready for pranayama. And I don't think I'm saying anything new, because if you look at the sutras of Patanjali, it says that first we learn yama niyama, then you learn asana. And what does it say about asana? It says, stira sukam asanam, be firm, but calm. Then the next sutra says something like, keep doing this physical activity until it becomes effortless. Then the next sutra says, once it becomes effortless, then all dualities will cease. Then after that, it says, now you are ready for pranayama. Meaning now it's not just now you're ready to breathe. Up until that point, it's assuming you've been breathing in the same way that we were given by nature, by God, by the deities that rule us, natural breathing. So then once you can establish a posture, have it maintained and sustainable for some texts, say three hours, then you're ready for pranayama, provided it's effortless and calm. Mm. 
this is a very similar analogy to what i have heard or on meditation uh, again with the same stages uh, pratyahara dhyana samadhi and uh, and how you, you mentioned about nc paul's book is that correct right yes yes i mean yes. because in the end the meditative place is a place of kevala kumbhaka a place where suddenly you realize you're not breathing at all it's the place that took your breath away but it's sustainable and so in the beginning it's better to teach people the principles of meditation and how to be meditative in posture simple posture just like seated on for most adults a chair is better but the floor possible and maybe other simple postures like adhumukha svanas and simple dog pose simple standing poses some symmetric asymmetrical poses but also to learn to meditate in movement as well so they can do gentle movements and for me the stages of meditation are often missed for me when i first saw meditation it was one of the most profoundly effective things it's when i first heard of yoga because i was about 15 years old probably and i was uh learning science at high school and my uh teacher was telling us about the nervous system and he says the nervous system has two main parts the conscious nervous system called somatic and the unconscious nervous system called autonomic and he says the somatic nervous system the conscious nervous system can be controlled by your conscious mind he said but the autonomic or automatic nervous system that cannot be controlled by the conscious mind and this, i read this in a textbook but right after this it said in brackets the conscious nervous system the answer the unconscious nervous system the autonomic nervous system cannot be controlled by the conscious mind and then in brackets except by some indian yogis and i went who are these strange people who can control their unconscious and mm. just after that around the same time i saw a picture of what looked like maybe a nepalese maybe indian or tibetan or chinese yogi sitting on what looked like mount everest like there were the snow all around them in a snow capped mountain and it said or the teacher said to me that person is meditating they are in yoga they are meditating so at that age at 15 years old i thought meditation was something that was very difficult and meditation and yoga were the same thing but in the modern world if you look on instagram people think that yoga is balance on one arm and do the splits and do a back arch and that meditation is sitting in a boring position being still and bored whereas actually i saw meditation to be this most very difficult thing of a person sitting naked in the snow and not getting cold and mm. being totally calm but having blood flowing through them so easily that that's what meditation was and i said that sounds difficult it's as if you have your own internal thermostat to control your temperature yes. be it cold or heat yes. you don't get yes. affected by the environment yes and i've seen indigenous australian aboriginal people do this also they can lower their body temperature and be naked in the very cold deserts of of winter australia and every traditional culture has learned these special secret techniques which in india you call yoga and other cultures have other words for them but what's magical is that they're doing this increased circulation while remaining completely calm and that's why i think it's so important to consider on a physiological level that our purpose in our practice is primarily to move good energy which i'll call good circulation with a low heart rate and loving information which i'll call the dominance of this very calming parasympathetic nervous system through the conduits of our body which of course we need to keep healthy and flexible and strong and functional but without the feelings of stress or tension or stretch etc so speaking about breathing does breathing less uh helps in someone uh helps in increasing uh, the life span like uh what we see in turtles like they generally breathe only 3 or 4 times a minute yes i i believe this is the case and i i never got to complete what i was going to say because it's such a big subject but basically when you begin the process of learning how to breathe at least naturally while doing activities and then gradually learn how to breathe less than normal which is obviously more difficult and you stop doing what most people are doing which is over breathing 
then you start to get benefits because you start to build up carbon dioxide. Now, unfortunately, because of people who sound really trustworthy, like the Vice President of the United States, who told us in 2007 that by 2017, all the major cities will be underwater because of global warming, which now they called climate change because sometimes places get hot, sometimes places get cold. I call it the weather. But um, nevertheless, he made carbon dioxide a very bad name. Even though carbon dioxide feeds our trees, it made many people think that carbon dioxide is bad for you. Whereas mm. actually carbon dioxide is a friend in our body and we require carbon dioxide. In fact, N.C. Paul in this Indian book from 1855 actually calls carbon dioxide a main factor in prana. Because carbon dioxide, when it's present in significant quantities, opens the blood vessels to the brain and brings more blood to the brain. Carbon dioxide in significant quantities will open the vessels of your lungs and allow oxygen to transfer much better from your lungs to your blood. Carbon dioxide in significant quantities also becomes carbonic acid in your blood and that has an effect on the nervous system and calms your nervous system, making you feel peaceful and relaxed. And one more important one is Carbon dioxide is the necessary prerequisite to be in your blood at significant quantities in order for the oxyhemoglobin, the red pigment in the blood which carries oxygen, to transfer its oxygen into your cells. And without it, it just simply doesn't do it. See, conversely, if you breathe more than normal, you will blow off your carbon dioxide. The more you breathe in, the more you have to breathe out. Mm. Every time you breathe out, you get rid of carbon dioxide. So the more you breathe, the less carbon dioxide you have. But the less you breathe, the slower you breathe, the less your minute ventilation is. The more you do kumbhaka for prolonged periods, the slower you breathe. Like I like inhaling two minutes, exhale two minutes. Then the more you build up carbon dioxide. But if you over breathe, if you breathe too much, which is also called hyperventilation, which is an element of sickness, then what you get is less blood flow to the brain, less oxygen from your lungs to your blood. You get a hyperstimulated nervous system, which becomes a flight or fight response. And you also get much less transfer of oxygen into your cells because there is this thing called the Bohr effect, which was discovered by a scientist named Bohr about a hundred years ago. And what it said basically was if us, if our red blood cells could speak, and they would come traveling through the body and they might come up to your big toe cell and they say, hello everyone, I'm oxyhemoglobin, I've got oxygen, who wants oxygen? And all the cells will go, we want oxygen, we want oxygen. It'll say, show me your carbon dioxide. And if they say, well, uh, I haven't got any carbon dioxide because I've just been to this uh, exercise class where they told me to take deep breath in and deep breath out and make this sound. <sighs> It'll say, so I've got no more carbon dioxide left. I blew it all out. They'll say, well, I'm sorry if you haven't got carbon dioxide. I'm out of here, says the oxyhemoglobin. This is called gas exchange. I'm supposed to give you oxygen. You give me back carbon dioxide. And if this doesn't happen, then of course, then glucose, which is a main energy source for the cells, will be possible to be metabolized or burnt either with oxygen or without oxygen. But like any fire, fires burn better with oxygen. And in terms of glucose metabolism, you can burn or metabolize gluca without, glucose without oxygen. And for every one glucose molecule, you'll create two molecules of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, which is like an energy source for the cells. So one glucose gives two energy currency. But if you burn or metabolize glucose in the presence of oxygen, you get 38 ATP, which is 19 times as much energy just by getting oxygen into cells. So what do you have to do to get oxygen into cells? You have to breathe less, not more. And of course, cancer thrives in the absence of oxygen. It's not to say that breathing more than normal gives you cancer or oxygen in the cells prevents cancer, but it just happens that cancer cells grow very quickly even without oxygen, and they love sugar. So they burn mm -hmm. sugar very quickly. Mm. Whereas normal cells 
grow very quickly and easily in the presence of oxygen and low sugar. Cancer cells grow very easily in the presence of high sugar and low oxygen. So what you're doing by not breathing so much is you're making your body become very hungry for more food and probably more sugar and probably making the possibility that cancer cells can thrive really easily. And if you look at it, if you think about what's important in the body, what we need for on, ongoing long-term health is as good and healthy a cardiovascular system as possible for pretty much healing every disease. But even considering things like cancer, where does cancer come? Cancer comes in the places where blood flows least. It comes in places like your lungs, your brain, your bone marrow, your stomach, your colon, your genitals, the, you know, the, uh, the gonads, so the uterus and the testes. But cancer comes least in places where there's most blood flow, like your heart. How often do people hear of heart cancer? Mm. And of course, good blood flow is only going to be useful for you if your body can heal. And when can the heart, when can the body heal best? When your immune system works well. But when your immune system works well is when you're in a calming state. But your blood will flow best when your heart rate stays low. Because if your heart rate is high, and that's what's making the blood flow, then you are also in a state of flight or fight, which turns off your immune system. So what we really want is to encourage blood flow while being very relaxed. And that's the function of pranayama, the art of getting blood to move through your cells very, very easily. Because what it does, the less you breathe, it opens up blood vessels and it calms your nerves. So it actually acts in two ways to help you uh, achieve the function of yoga, which is to improve uh, the circulation and to keep you calm. Um, yes, actually, this topic is very deep itself. Means, I guess we need to have a specific, separate episode for this. Yes, <laughs> Just for I this. Think so. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure whether have you heard of uh, Wim Hof. Yes, he's a wonderful man. He's, uh, he's rung me up on a couple of occasions and asked me questions. And we were going to do a workshop together, but it, it didn't eventuate in the end. Oh, wow. I love what he's doing. And the principle is, is in theory very good. And I practice a very similar technique. Because as you know, his technique really is based on, a, on an Indian yoga technique, which is very similar to Bastrika, or in a way it's like Shakti Chalani Pranayama, or something like this, where very loosely, what he's getting people to do for people who are not familiar with it, we, he's getting people to hyperventilate first and breathe more than normal. And then he gets them to hypoventilate next and not breathe at all for a significant period of time. And I also practice the original technique, not the one that he does, but something more akin to Indian yoga. He's basically taken the philosophy of Indian yoga out of it and just called it a technique, which is fine for some people. It works better. But the problem is, as I see it, is he's teaching it to 500 people at once sometimes. And of course, and, you know, he's a very capable man. If he's teaching it to one person, he will make sure they do it properly. But I believe something which is as complex and potentially as dangerous as breathing can be when it's done this way should be taught to much smaller groups and make sure they prepare properly. Because what I've often heard of when people are doing this technique in a large group or maybe learning it from a video or learning it from friends is that they, they don't realize the importance of the breath retention after the hyperventilation. And for example, if I do the technique, I maybe might hyperventilate for a few minutes, you know, and do deep, full breath in, deep, full breath out, until a point where you can feel pins and needles come to your fingers. And this is a state of tetanus. Incidentally, for anyone who doesn't know, and even Wim Hof says this, you must never do this while you're standing up or while you're driving or underwater, no, no. you can faint. And of course, some people erroneously took his technique and people have died with Wim Hof's technique, not necessarily through Wim Hof's technique, but because they didn't do it properly and they didn't listen to what he said. But is it safe to give a dangerous technique to hands of lay people? That I'll question, you know, because in the techniques as they're taught in the Indian yoga texts, often what it will say is every sutra that I read begins with the word atta, which I understood to mean, and then, and now, we'll begin this next sutra. And then every sutra, most sutras, will finish with, and now, keep this a secret. 
and then the next sutra will start. So he says, Atta, now, now that you have learned the stuff I've told you, now I'm going to tell you the next secret. Mm. And so many of the techniques that we're using in something like Wim Hof would only be taught to certain uh, aspirants once they've learned certain other techniques. So I will not teach something like a Wim Hof technique to my students until I'm convinced that they can breathe naturally under stress. I'm also needing to be convinced that they understand the physiology of breathing. I also want to know that they can hold their breath for a significant period of time already and that they react well to stress. But what I've seen is, and, and so what I do is if I'm doing the hyperventilation myself first and I breathe fast for a few minutes, when I hold my breath, I'm going to hold my breath for a minimum of five or six minutes. And if I wow. don't, say, for example, if I only hold my breath for four minutes, it's like I, I, I wasted my time. It's not going to have a good effect. The technique will be, okay, if I hold my breath for less than three minutes, it almost feels like it's had a negative effect. It's also made me a little bit overstimulated. Maybe you get some reasonable physical effects, like, you know, you've exercised your tummy muscles. When I do the technique and I say breathe uh, hyperventilate for four or five minutes and then hold my breath for six minutes. And I did this once with a university controlled study when my mouth was with a gas mask over it and I had wires attached to a computer. The computer said that after doing the technique and it could read how much air is coming in and out through the gas mask, it said that I did hold my breath for six and a half minutes. But right after holding my breath, I you know, I actually felt I could have held my breath longer, but I was afraid I, I might faint because you can faint. So I let my breath out and my air goes out and in very easily. I didn't pant. I went back to normal breathing and I sat there feeling remarkably peaceful. I felt super calm, at ease. I felt energized. I felt warm. And I thought to myself for a moment, I have never felt this good in my life. And a few seconds passed and I thought, wow, I feel amazing. I feel calm, clear, focused, peaceful, energized. And I went, wow, I've never felt this good in my life. And actually a few seconds later, I thought this again, just this one quick thought, wow, I feel amazing. Then I thought I better open my eyes. I didn't need to, but I thought because the scientists and the professor were there waiting for my conversation because it had been quite a long experiment. And the scientist said, I don't understand what's just happened there. And I said, why? What just happened? He said, you told us you were going to hold your breath. And I said, I did. He said, no, you held your breath twice. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he showed me the graph. And the graph went up, down, up, down fast for five minutes where I was hyperventilating, deep, full breath in, deep, long, full breath out. Then it showed me make a big breath in. And the line of the computer went to a flat line. And it showed that for six and a half minutes, I didn't breathe at all. Then it showed the graph go down and then up a little bit, down a little bit, and then it went flat line again. And according to the computer, measuring the air coming in and out of my nose, it said I did not breathe for more than eight minutes after this point. And at that time, I was just sitting there going, I feel great. I've never felt this great in my life. I feel mm -hmm. peaceful, calm, energized, focused. And I thought just a couple of seconds had passed. But in fact, I think I was in the closest state to Samadhi I've ever got. A feeling of total oneness with everything around me in the total so present a moment, I didn't even feel time pass. And only a couple of moments, I thought, wow, I feel amazing. And I felt great for many days afterwards. But that was probably the most I've pushed what effectively is like a Wim Hof technique, but mm. really is an ancient yogic technique. But most of the people I talk to who do his technique do not hold their breath anywhere near that long. I'm sure he does. I'm sure he's a very, very capable practitioner. It's not a problem with him or his technique. It's the way it's being received by the world mm. and the way that people will tend to do things a little bit too quick without really the learning that's required to go beforehand. Okay, I feel uh, the issue is that since we are in the age of hyper-connectivity, uh, whatever information we project is very much easily transmitted to anyone else. And uh, again, whatever uh, Indian yogis had taught, uh, they were taught by the Guru Shishya Parampara. So I, like one person teaches to the other and that's it. And when the next person oh, no, gets, becomes a guru. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
So one to one teaching is the one. real art of yoga. It's this uh, guru guru shishya relationship. And without this, then you always have possibility of loss of transmission of information. Mm. And that's the modern world. It's how we have to teach now. That's true. That's true. Especially during COVID times when we everyone is connecting each other with Zoom. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And you know, I love the idea that we can connect on the internet and we can share these thoughts with, you know, many, many people and that yoga is being spread and the ideas of yoga are being spread. It just saddens me to see if people get the wrong impression. And so I'm seeing, you know, in the last 20 years, especially that yoga has been reduced to something which is not so different to the aerobics of the sixties and seventies for many modern Westerners. And that meditation has been reduced to something which is just basically concentration, which is not invaluable. But what I want to see is people going back to meditation, which could really have positive effects on not just the physical body, but also your physiology as well. And of course, there are some adepts who get this, but most people miss the benefits of meditation in the modern world because they associate meditation with something which is static. And most people are static enough already. They associate it with sitting and most people sit five to 15 hours a day already. Whereas I think if people realize that you could get the meditative state in a dynamic place, I think dynamic meditation is better for the modern world and they'll get better effects. And especially dynamic meditation will give them this important feature of meditation, which is lost in static meditation. And that is the idea of blood flow. You see, I think med the meditative state has to have five features. One is it has to be a sustainable activity. You need to be able to do it for up to many hours. Second thing is it must be engaging. In other words, it can't be too boring. Otherwise, people just don't do it. It has to be calming without being boring. But it has to be also stimulating enough to keep people engaged without being stressful. So it has to be putting people in the present moment and make them feel connected. And that's a brainwave place as well. The third thing about meditative state is it has to have a calming response, parasympathetic dominance. The fourth thing is it must give you this feeling of it being effortless, like you're not struggling to do it. It's not going to mean you have to stop in a little bit. No point being in a lotus posture meditating if you, all you think is, my knees, my knees, I can't take this any longer. You know, it has to be something which you can keep doing. And the fifth thing is it must move blood. You must feel like the yogi on the, on the, on the snow-capped mountain where you don't, it's not like someone living in Canada or, or Northern Europe or Southern Australia where you're sitting in a room covered in blankets and your fingers and toes are getting cold because you're meditating. No, you should be able to be warm, regardless and that comes with a deeper understanding of meditation a deeper understanding of how to move energy through the body and i think that will come with a good understanding of mudra kriya pranayama and learning hatha yoga you know i think one more thing is that hatha yoga is often talked about as saptanga yoga so we have ashtanga yoga we talk about the eightfold path we yama, niyama, rasana, pranayama, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. But then uh, hatha yoga, which is really the essence of the Geranda Samhita's hatha yoga, they talk about it as called saptanga, seven part, sevenfold path. So first level of um, hatha yoga is kriya. And kriya involves things like understanding Uddiyana Bandha, Nauli, Lauliki, and you know, even things like Kapalabhati and, and things like this. And a lot of very important things like Basti, where you learn how to breathe in a, in a way where your pelvic floor is open, not closed. And other important things like Drishti, because they talk about Trataka. It's a real basis of yoga. Then the next stage after kriya is asana. You're supposed to have learned all these important things before asana. Then the third stage after that is the upgrade of asana, which is mudra, which is asana where the energy flows through it. Then you're supposed to learn pranayama. And then they say, you know, uh, mm. dhyana samadhi. And I think this hatha yoga approach is an important one for the West because they're attempting to be postural yogis, but they're not really following the path of postural yoga. Mm. That's true. That's true. So we've come to the end of our show. Um, Simon, what is a message you would like to share with everyone? Oh, thank you. Look, um, I think the biggest message that I'd like to share is for everyone in the world to recognize what yoga is saying, 
which is no different to what modern physics says. It says the world is a connected place. We are all connected as brother and sister in the world, also connected to the animals, the plants, the trees, and the earth. And the universe has its main connecting agent is consciousness. So my philosophy of personal life is enjoy your life. That's why we've got it, I think. Look after your body. It's your temple. Help other people enjoy their lives. Then you have a purpose. And I think uh, these principles serve me well. And I live by Yama and Niyama. That's very well said, uh, Simon. So uh, what you just said, uh, that to, f- to have good energy and vibration, first you have to create good energy within you and then you yes, have yes. to spread it. That's very well yes. said. It's like they say the airplanes. Before you put the gas mask on someone else, put it on yourself first. Mm. You can't be a good parent with your children unless you also look after. Mothers have to look after themselves before they can look after children. So always look after yourself. And a great Indian man, I think his name is, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, the great Indian writer. He said, um, I'll think of his name in a second. He said that we make a point, Deepak Chopra, what wonderful man. He oh, said, okay. he yeah. said, we make appointments to be a very famous guy, you know, like, but he's, he's nevertheless of Indian heritage. And he said, we make appointments every day with all sorts of people all over the world. But the one appointment you must never forget to make is the appointment with yourself to take some time to show love to yourself, to show care for yourself, look after yourself, enjoy your life, look after your body, then help other people enjoy their lives. That's true. That's true. So, um, Simon, thank you for coming and gracing us and sharing all your learnings. Um, where can everyone find you on the internet? Bless you. Okay, so I have two main websites. One is yogasynergy.com, which we can put the link to, y-o-g-a-s-y-n-e-r-g-y.com, which I have with Bianca Matchless, my business partner, and we give traditional yoga sequences applicable for the modern body. And we're about to run a very... Uh, powerful online intensive training which will start in the next few weeks and half of it is pre-recorded of our special online courses and half of it will be live zoom classes like this with Bianca and Mai so it's a 200 hour intensive starting very very soon and that'll be fantastic you can also get a, a yoga alliance teaching certificate out of it but obviously you can't teach someone to be a teacher in 200 hours I think that's a bit of a crazy modern thing but I can give a good bout of information in 200 hours and so that's being offered and we have lots of online courses there and i also have my personal website which is under my name simonborgolivier.com as one word you can also get to that same site by going five dimensional flow.com and uh, i can give you those links as well and on that site i have a membership site where people can ask me questions and i have a whole bunch of videos they can watch and practice with and also have a few different courses on how to do traditional yoga etc and if people want to you can uh, go to my website simonborgolivia.com and subscribe to the newsletter and subscribe to both sites on both sites but on my personal site i'll also send you uh, a set of links to some practice videos where you might try some of the practices like i've described in their different forms and hopefully get some of the benefits you can from that and i've got a book you can also download as well thank you so much Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you for gracing on our show. Thank you very much. Bless you. Namaste to everyone and to you too. Thank you. To your family. Yeah.